Welcome to the third episode of our Introduction to Dependency Injection. In this episode, we'll show you how to eliminate the remaining hard dependencies on those input and output implementations that we had in the startup class in Example 2. And in addition, we're going to do this using the Service Locator Design Pattern, which gives us the additional benefit of providing a means for configuring the implementation choices that we make for those input and output implementations, which will be external to the application. So this is an easy way to configure the app without having to recompile or without having to redeploy any code. OK, so let's begin by examining the new startup class for example three. As you can see here, um, the message service um, is still being used. But notice that unlike the previous version, there is absolutely no uh, dependency or indication of which input and output classes we're using. So by way of comparison, let's look at the previous example, example two. Let's look at the startup screen for that. And as you can see here, that the um, GUI message input is being referenced along with the console message output. Now these are hard dependencies. Uh, and that means that the startup class really is very limited in the types of input and output it can do. And the only way we can change it is to modify this code. So what we'd like is to be able to eliminate the dependency altogether, making this more flexible, but at the same time be able to change these easily without having to recompile or edit source code. So let's take a look at how we go about that. Notice that um, the service class is being instantiated, and then we simply ask the message to be displayed. There's no indication of uh, how input and output is being done whatsoever. So we say that that behavior is encapsulated or hidden away um, in the message service class. So let's take a look at that new message service class. Here we are, and you can see that the only major change, or actually the only change at all, is that we are now using this service locator um, class to get instances, to get um, the input service and output service objects. But where are they coming from? Well, we'll look at that in a moment. But let's just compare this class against the previous example, example two. So here's example two, and as you can see in example two, there's no service locator. Um, we use, we pass in the input and output uh, dependent uh, component objects um, based on abstractions, very flexible, this is very portable. Uh, in the new version, we don't pass anything in. Um, we use the service locator class to retrieve those objects. But where are they being retrieved from? They're coming out of a properties file. A properties file is just a plain text file ending in dot properties. And in that file, you have on the left side a term, which we call the key, an equal sign, and then a, another term, which we call the value. Now, in this case, the value is the fully qualified name of a class. And what we're doing here is we're saying that right now we want to use GUI message input and console message output. So what the service locator does is it reads these, um, and what we do is we ask the service locator to retrieve pre-configured instances of those classes. So how does it go about doing that? Well, here's an example of the service locator class. Now, I've written this um, as a singleton, although it doesn't have to be. A singleton is another design pattern that indicates there will only be uh, one instance, one global instance of a class. So as you can see, the constructor is declared private. That way nobody can uh, create instances on their own. But we have this static property that holds an instance of a service locator. And then we have a static method called getInstance that retrieves an instance of a service locator. What happens is we check to see if the instance property is null, and if it is, we create a new instance. However, if it's not null, we create the we return the existing instance. In this way, one and only one instance of the service locator uh, is is possible. And this is just convenient because we don't really need more than one. Um, and then what happens is when we ask that instance to retrieve an input service. What it does is it uses the 
Java Util Properties class to retrieve a property from the properties file. So all we do is we ask for the key. So in this case, the key is input class. And what it does is it retrieves this value. But that value is not an instance. That value is just a string. So we take that value and we pass it to the uh, static method for name of the class class. And that gives us a class object. We can then use the class object to programmatically create an instance. And we do have to cast that to its uh, abstract, abstract type. This gives us an output object. We do the same thing for the input object. So as you can see, um, the only thing that's remaining is how does the properties object get made and where does it, how does it know where to find this properties file? Well, we've got a little utility method down here to retrieve the properties. All you do is instantiate an instance of the properties object, class I should say, and then ask that to load uh, a file input stream where we pass in the, a path to, and this is a relative path, to our properties file. So that gives us our properties object, and then we simply use that properties object to retrieve the individual property. So in our service class, we ask the service locator to give us an instance. Remember, this is a singleton instance. We then use that instance to retrieve the input service. Notice the actual methodology of finding and creating the object is totally encapsulated or hidden away inside the service locator class. So this is a, another um, great way to um, make your code more readable and easy to maintain by hiding away those details. And that's really the only change to the service class. Otherwise, it's exactly the same. We're still basing our input and output serve, uh, objects on our uh, abstractions. And that means that we can, as long as the objects we're retrieving are based on those interfaces, we can create new ones, we can add, remove, change, anytime we want. All right, so startup creates a service object. Oops, we're in the wrong startup example. That was example two. Here's example three. Sorry about that. Uh, startup creates a service object. The service object um, talks to the service locator, which finds our input and output objects and wires them up for use. And then we simply ask our service object to display the message. And as in previous examples, displaying a message really involves delegating the work of input to the input object and output to the output object. So there you have it. Clean, simple, um, let's see if it works. Run. Here's our input. And here's our output. Great. OK, now before we put this to rest, let's um, summarize some of the advantages or pros and cons of, this, of using the service locator pattern to uh, get rid of our dependencies. So pros to begin with. Um, configuration of the uh, objects that you're injecting is, is, can, can be external to your application. It's just a text file with a dot properties extension. You can place that file anywhere on the hard drive and um, reference it using an absolute or relative path. And when you make your configuration external, you can change the way your application behaves by changing the class name of the dependent objects in that external configuration file. And this means that changes can be made without having to edit source code, without having to recompile that source code, without having to redeploy the source code, you simply edit a text file. Another advantage is that it removes the dependencies on the delegate components entirely, making your code more flexible and portable. However, there are some cons to using the service locator pattern. For one thing, 
you do need the additional service locator code in your application. So this means additional labor, this means additional maintenance, and it's additional code that uh, you have to just manage. In addition, you're now creating a dependency on the service locator class. Although you could base this on an abstraction as well, but the point is you have something additional that you're dependent on. So it's still better be in the sense that you have an externally configurable uh, application, but you do have this extra overhead of the service locator class itself. So that's it for now. In our next episode, we're going to be looking at how we can remove the service locator and use the Spring framework for an even more powerful form of dependency injection. Thanks for listening. See you next time.